Welcome, welcome. I'm Bryn Austin. I'm faculty in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and I direct the program STRIPE, Strategic Training Initiative for Prevention of Eating Disorders, based here at the school and also at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm delighted today to be able to welcome my colleague, Dr. Emilio Compti, who is here as a visiting scholar with STRIPE this week. We will get started in just a moment. I just want to give a little bit of background and then I will turn it over to Dr. Compte. Uh, for the presentation today, you'll have an opportunity to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, please be thinking about questions you want to ask. Uh, we'll leave time to be able to answer audience questions. Uh, so think about those that you can put in the chat. Today's uh, event is being recorded. And we will post it on the, the website for the school and the Stripe website next week with captions. So if you had uh, colleagues or anyone who wanted to see it, couldn't join now live, they'll be able to see the recording next week. I'm delighted to, that this event is co-sponsored by the Population Mental Health uh, Group at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Stripe. And it's a delight to be able to collaborate again with that group headed up by Dr. Karisten Conan. Uh, so, uh, a few more points to mention. Again, for anyone who's just joining us now, be thinking about your questions. You'll be able to put those in the Q&A. Now, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Compte, who is going to be presenting today his talk, Missing Men and Other Gender Dilemmas in Eating Disorders Assessment for Research and Clinical Care. So, Dr. Compte, as I mentioned, is a visiting scholar with Striped this week. He's a researcher and assistant professor of the Eating Behavior Research Center of the School of Psychology at Universidad, Universidad Adolfo Ibanez in Chile, where he is also the director of the master's program in eating disorders. Dr. Compte also serves as the director of research in the department at Comisar de Nuevo Treatment Center in Mexico. Dr. Compte holds an undergraduate degree in psychology from Belgrano University in Argentina, a specialization degree in statistics for health sciences at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, a master's degree in psychology research methods from the University of Granada in Spain, and a PhD in clinical psychology at the Autonomous University in Madrid, Spain. In 2018 and 2019, he completed a postdoctoral visiting program from the Fulbright Commission at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Compte is also playing a number of leadership roles in the Academy for Eating Disorders, which is the, the leading global professional society for eating disorders, researchers, clinicians, and patient carers or uh, people with lived experience with eating disorders. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Compte to share your slides, Emilio, and to begin your lecture. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Bryn. Let me share my slides. Okay, here we are. And uh, here we go. Well, hello to everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. I very much appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts together. First, uh, I would make would like to mention that I have no conflict of interest to to disclosure that there is no um, supplements company uh, paying me for this. Unfortunately, if there's any someone from the supplement industry, well, we can have a conversation after this. But uh, back again to the presentation. As the title suggests, this talk is going to be about. Uh, nuances in the assessment of eating disorders, uh, in particular those to be considered among boys and men, and their impact on their research and practice. Somehow, the male experience of eating disorders has gone unnoticed for some time. However, nowadays, most research and clinical work has been done, and we have a better understanding of the presentation of eating disorders among boys and men. So this talk will also be about what are the lessons that we have learned throughout this process, as they may help us to understand other still remaining understudied populations. First, um, I have organized this talk in, in three brief um, uh, top, subtopics. 
I will first describe the, um, the, a, a, a short review on how eating disorders turned into a woman's only field. Then we will discuss the context in which muscle dysmorphia was first described and how this has impact in research and clinical practice. And then I will just summarize with some uh, um, conclusions about the, the, the lessons learned. So this is one of the papers that it's uh, mandatory papers from, uh, for my students back down in Chile. This article has been published in 2007 and review most of the most relevant risk factors for eating disorders. But uh, at the same time, it gives us a conceptualization, which was the conceptualization that we used to have about eating disorders after all the research and the clinical work conducting during the 80s and the 90s. It is uh, interesting that they, they, they mention that uh, the uh, eating disorders are in some way cultural sensitive. There is, um, it, 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 it suggests that sociocultural models of eating disorders have emphasized the Western culture of the uh, female's beauty ideal of extreme thinness, objectification of the female body uh, as a specific risk factor for the development of eating disorders. But in particular, it is also mentioned that women outnumbered men in any uh, epidemiological studies available at that time. So let's try to understand how this has become to be considered a females only pathology when it was originally described by Richard Morton in 1689. Um, he, he, Richard Morton made the first description of a syndrome that nowadays is understood as anorexia nervosa. And he gave a, an example using a teenage boy and a, a teenage girl. What, what, what I mean to say is that from the very beginning, uh, eating disorders was something that affected both genders. And uh, later, later development of Gula and, and Lassage, they, what they've done, they, they describe a phenotype which nowadays is known as anorexia nervosa. And that was based on the family dynamics of two male patients. And curiously, at that time, the term anorexia nervosa was coined to describe the syndrome among men as an alternative term to anorexia hysterica based on the assumption that males were not uh, able to be diagnosed with uh, a hysteria. The description and treatment option for hysteria almost dominated the mental health field during the late uh, 18th century until half of the 20th century. The premise that men were not affected by eating disorders was supported throughout uh, um, the time by a constant evolving expansion of the psychiatry and clinical psychology fields. During, it was, where, during that time, it was developed the assessment tools, the diagnostic conceptualizations, and the treatment modalities. For example, the E26, which is a very widely used screening instrument for eating disorders, was developed in 1982. And uh, um, men were also thought not to, to be subject of eating disorder due to a lack of an equivalent endocrine deficit to amenorrhea uh, among them. And let's remind that in the DSM-4, which, which came out in 1990, in order to be diagnosed with an eating disorder, you, uh, with an, mainly with an anorexia nerviosa, the individual has to go through um, three months or in, in the absence of their menstrual cycle. Uh, having amenorrhea as a diagnostic criteria uh, totally excluded men of the possibility of, ha of having an eating disorder. So um, my guess is that when, 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 when men were excluded 
from 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 uh, the understanding of 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 of, of his, his hysteria much emphasis has been placed on a woman and try to understand her relationship with the social pressures towards appearance. Many of the um, psychosocial models will also develop at that time. An example of it is the tripartite influence model described by Thompson and colleagues, which su suggests that social pressures toward appearance uh, from family, peers, and media contributes to the thin uh, internalization, which leads to body dissatisfaction and subsequent eating disorders pathology. Later, description from Fabron suggests that the DSM scheme of, for, for classifying eating disorders encouraged the view that um, anorexia, bulimia, nervosa are the thin clinical stage each requiring their own treatment. However, evidence, not only research, but clinical evidence that not support this idea. Eating disorder patients um, have mainly features in common and patients migrate between the diagnosis over time uh, and temporary um, migration, it's the norm rather than the exemption. Um, all, all of this, has a process has shown us how, despite that from the very beginning, anorexia nervosa was described in both men and women throughout time, men have been um, ex excluded from the study of uh, eating disorders. This is an example of how the tripartite model of influence um, have an impact and, and, and which are the mechanisms of, 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 of developing eating disorders. The source of influence contributes to um, body behaviors, uh, body comparison behaviors, which would help to um, internalize a, a body ideal, which will lead to body dissatisfaction and this uh, will turn into um, disordered eating behaviors. And uh, also very important, it's the conceptualization done by Fairman in the transdiagnosis model. Um, it's the, the, according to this model, there is a, um, a core psychopathology of uh, over evaluation and shape of weight under control that may lead to some specific behaviors in order to achieve those ideals. So we are talking about a dysfunctional scheme of a self-evaluation. We are talking about rigid and restricted dieting. We are talking about the effect of weight loss, which in, in turn may reinforce this psychopathology and the strict dieting. But also we are talking about binge eating compensative behavior, which could be purgative and non-purgative, and the emo emotion regulation um, e e effect of, of, of binge eating. Altogether, this, this uh, conceptualizations of what eating disorders were on which was their symptomatic ex expression led to the development of assessment tools. And those assessment tools are go, were, were meant to, to, to consider and to assess the, the clinical features described in the previous models. So let's review some sample items of, of those, those models. <clears throat> no, sorry, of those, of those uh, questioners. Avoiding eating when I'm hungry, have the impulse to vomit after meals, I'm preoccupied with a desire to be thinner. I feel extremely guilty after eating. Feel that other pressures me to eat. The ED, I, well, you have, we have three versions and sample items are, I feel extremely guilty after overeating. I'm terrified of gaining weight. I'm preoccupied with a desire to be thinner. When I am upset, I'm, I'm worried that I will start eating and the, large used and world famous EDQ, which said, posits that 
questions about if the, the person has gone for long periods of time, like eight waking hours or more without eating in an attempt to influence their shape and or weight, <clears throat> or if they have a, a, defin a, a desire to have an empty stomach aiming to influence their shape of weight, and if they had a strong desire to, to lose weight. So all of these assessment measures, that, as, as I mentioned, they, all of the three of them are very, uh, very used throughout research and practice. They were assessing what we understood at that time, what eating disorders was. Eating disorder was uh, something about a problem for, of, of, of me, white middle to upper class woman from English speaking country, um, mostly um, uh, affected by a, a drive for thinness, which had a symptomatic expression of dietary restraint or binge eating, weight loss and weight gain changes in, 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 in their weight, uh, a shared psychopathology of over-evaluation, weight, shape, under control, and the presence of compensatory purging and non-purging behavior. So this, this, uh, this paper, which may not be up to date, I still think it gives us a, a pretty much clear understanding of what we thought eating disorders were. Eating disorders were about to be thin, to pursue for thinness, or failures in that uh, in, in, in pursuing for, for, for thinness. If we use at that time using the available assessment measures, lifetime prevalence of anorexia nervosa and bulimia nerviosa was much more higher than in, in women than in men. And uh, the um, uh, epidemiological studies, this is uh, uh, epidemiological studies conducted in, 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 in the US, which, which is summarized in this, in this, in this paper I'm showing, they, they, they observed known cases of uh, anorexia nervosa in a representative sample of a high school students and uh, among men, and uh, very few cases of bulimia nervosa um, among, among men uh, across high, high schools. So I like to call this section the, the elephant in the room because whenever, whenever I, I get a chance to talk about this and to give a, a lecture about, about this, uh, I always have people coming uh, to me saying, uh, I know someone with this, like it's, it's, it's it, it's we, we are putting a name. I'm going to be putting a name to something that you you will you might have probably seen before. At the, the late uh, 1980s, there was um, um, uh, Harrison Pope and David Katz wrote a letter to the editor of the Lancet about the Vatimilder uh, psychosis. Uh, they were studying the psychiatric effects of um, bodybuilder of, of steroid use among bodybuilders, and uh, psych psychiatric effects were like mania, uh, hypomania, mania, um, some kind of, of delusions, uh, an increase um, uh, of um, aggressiveness. And uh, they, they aim to, um, to increase the, the sample size of the study. The letter only showed two, two clinical cases. So they recruited 108 uh, male bodybuilders. And despite they were assessing the psychiatric effect as, as many times in science for the surprise, they observed something quite unexpected. Almost 10% of the sample believed that they looked small and weak, even though they were large and muscular. And they refer to this uh, syndrome as reverse anorexia. Reverse anorexia resembles eating disorders in terms of the persistent preoccupation with perceived body uh, flaws and characteristic behavior to deal with this body image disturbances. But, but more relevant is this consequence, this uh, conclusion they arrived to. 
uh, reverse anorexia, it was believed to be uh, the analog response of young, woman, young, young men who were influenced by social pressure to be bigger as evidence in the gym subculture, the bodybuilding magazines, and in many Hollywood movies with uh, bodybuilding he heroes. So uh, while anorexia was driven by for a desire to, to be thin, which it was consistent with the social pressure uh, received by women, reverse anorexia was driven by a desire to increase their mus muscularity and gain weight. This is very important. People were aiming to gain weight, not in body fat, but in terms of muscle mass. And this was consistent with the social pressures um, felt by, 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 by men. Interestingly, at the same time, um, uh, by the uh, at the late in 1980s, we didn't have an uh, internet uh, connection as, as well as we have it right now. And, and uh, we were not that much communicated. So it was very interesting to see that other, other researchers have found uh, similar um, findings. Uh, they were studying, uh, Silverstein and colleagues were studying 92 males and women, and they found that men and women did not dif differ in the degree of the body dissatisfaction. The difference was on the direction of that body dissatisfaction. While, while men were more likely to, be, to want to be heavier and thinner, no woman wanted to be heavier. Body, body image, as, as, as Tilka has, Tracy Tilka has suggested in, in uh, later uh, developments, body, body, body image concerns about men. It's not just about being more muscular because there are some men who would wanna lose weight at some point, but we are gonna review this issue with a clinical case that I will be presenting. So we, we, we are in a new paradigm. Men can have uh, eating disorders, but those eating disorders, they go from, uh, to, to a different direction that they used to go with women. While women were attempting to lose weight, women, men, some men were attempting to gain weight in terms of muscle mass. And uh, many research has been conducted in order to assess uh, how this um, uh, I, male body ideal has changed throughout time. And what they did is they replicate many studies that have been conducted among women. One famous study is, was uh, how, how, how did the, the the Barbie doll figure changed across time, and they found that it became taller and thinner. And uh, they tried to replicate that using um, action action uh, toys. They selected two lines of toys that have been in the market for more than 25 years, and they compare the original figure versus the, uh, um, the, original, the origi original figure that had 25 years of age and against the current figure at, at that time. And these are some pictures where we can see how, how the, 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 the male body in action toys have uh, had developed more muscle mass. I used to play with, with, with this, with, I'm that old that I used to play with these toys and in the left. And, uh, um, and, and, and now an, an, an observation made by the researchers is that current actual, actual um, uh, action toys, they showed a, a, a muscle mass composition that it could either be achievable through uh, steroid use or it may go further or beyond the human capacity. So young children are playing with, 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 with toys that have a, a muscle development, which is uh, beyond the, 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 the human capacity. This is the other line of, 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 of toys they, they've studied. 
it's not that 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 uh, that um, we, we are not able to see uh, Luke Skywalker uh, pectoral due to global warming or because it's it's hot uh, up here in Boston, but because uh, it, it it shows a, a higher um, uh, muscle development than the original figure, and uh, this is this is. Um, uh, one, one, one of my, my favorite part of the presentations. Uh, another study that has been conducted was to compare the, 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 the body of the male models on the plagal centerfolds. This was also based uh, on a previous research conduct in women. They have been, they they've, uh, have assessed how the body of the, of the female models uh, in the play, Playboy Center world uh, have changed and uh, through time they have observed that models became uh, thinner. So they try to replicate and uh, if, if, we, if, we, if we try to picture these models in, in right now, for example, in some, some dating apps, I don't, I'm not sure how successful they would be if we compare them to the, 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 the current models, current models tends to be uh, um, bigger and having a, a higher um, muscle development. So some conclusions to share about this is that um, figures have grown much more muscular over time and uh, many of them exceeding the, the, the human capacity. Uh, the, the, this these observations represent a male analog of the previous studies about the uh, the evolving um, appearance of the of female dolls such as Barbie, and uh, st studies among children. Uh, there are some studies that they they they've taken this 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 toys uh, to high school students. Uh, they ask for their preferences, and. Uh, Students mentioned that despite that they've seen the original figures as more normal, they've chosen the current figures, those figures that have um, uh, a muscle development beyond the human capacity, they've chosen this, those figures over the current figures, mostly due to their physical appearance. As I said, the Prager Center for became increasingly dense, and this was shown through a significant correlation between uh, BMI, the fat free mass index, and the year of publication. As the year of publication was uh, um, uh, uh, growed, it also growed the, the muscle development of, of the model. Overall, this observation suggests that the cultural norms of the male idea are growing increasingly uh, muscular. But let's remember, let's have in mind what were those questions included in the um, assessment tools, in the eating disorder assessment tools. And most of them were um, uh, focused on the desire to lose weight. Many of those questions ask if the people wanted to be thinner, if they were avoiding food despite feeling hundred in order to um, uh, uh, achieve that thin ideal, but you won't find that in someone who is trying to increase uh, his or her um, muscle mass. Someone who will try to increase his muscle mass will be uh, more into a regular diet, mostly based in, in protein. So since they, the, the, there were no, um, uh, there, were, there were differences in, in the eating, in the available eating disorders measures at that time, there were differences between the scores of people with eating disorders and those individuals believed to have uh, reverse anorexia. They thought this was not an eating disorder. Because in eating disorders, individuals are preoccupied that they are too fat and they develop primary pathological patterns and only secondary exercise patterns. Those pathological patterns over eating were not observed among those people with reverse anorexia. Since those uh, pathological patterns were not observed, 
this syndrome has been reconceptualized as a form of um, body dysmorphic disorder. But the thing is, and um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a great spoiler of my own presentation, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm I, I will, I, I'll do that all the time, so I will do it today. Um, the thing is that it's not that they didn't have pathological or dysfunctional eating patterns. It is that the dysfunctional and eating patterns that they present were not captured by the available um, eating disorders measures at that time. Eating disorders measures at that time were meant to assess drive for thinness and related attitudes and behaviors. And uh, muscle dysmorphia individuals or reverse anorexia individuals were not attempting to lose weight, were attempting to gain weight in terms of muscle mass. So their, their own disorder eating was different. It was mode protein-based, uh, um, a protein-based diet, they, they've eaten in, in, in short periods of time in order to have a continuous protein consumption. The clinical features described in, in this paper was a chronic concern with muscularity, extreme anxiety, and if deprived from physical exercise, strict diet, a lifestyle around physical exercise and diet, a health risk combination of substance use diet and exercise, avoidance behaviors and appearance uh, checking behaviors, and uh, deterioration of interpersonal, of interpersonal relationship. If, if, if we do not consider the first uh, clinical feature listed here, we, we, we may agree that we are talking about an eating disorders. Actually, when I uh, was, um, I'm from Argentina, relocated to Chile three years ago, when I was seeing patients in Argentina, I, 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 was, I worked with eating disorder patients and also with patients with body dysmorphic disorders. Um, eating disorder patients and patients with body dysmorphic disorders share this body dysmorphic concerns. But the, the main difference is that people with but it is morphic disorders, they don't show pathological eat, eating patterns. But people with muscle dysmorphia, they do show pathological eating patterns. They have very restrictive data, mostly based on um, protein consumption. All of this has, had, all of this develops were prior to the DSM-5. And while the, the, there was this discussion of the DSM-5, Two hallmark reviews came, uh, came out, one by Catherine Phillips and colleagues. Catherine Phillips is a very well-known expert of uh, body dysmorphic disorder. And she has suggested that muscle dysmorphia, it's most likely to occur in males and that it appears to have some clinical difference with the other um, types of body dysmorphic disorder, which may result in some requirements of treatment adaptions and that muscle dysmorphia may be more closely linked than other forms of body dysmorphic disorder to eating disorders. And also a review by Stuart Murray suggests the recognition of muscle dysmorphia as an eating disorder may offer a more clinical and utility recognition and, uh, of, the, of the male experience of eating disorders. But what happened? At the end, muscle dysmorphia has it's been conceptualized as a specifier of body dysmorphic disorder in a total contradiction with the fourth criterion of body dysmorphic disorder, which posits that the appearance preoccupation is not very ex explained by concerns with body fat or weight, which actually it is the case. So, which are the implications for the, clinic, uh, the, the research and clinical practice of this? If we, if we keep the, 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 the conceptualization that we have of eating disorders in the, the, line, in the late 1990s or at the beginning of the year two, two, 2000, we will arrive to the conclusion that yes, eating disorders is mostly a, a, a female psychopathology. 
And uh, this is just a, a reminder of the questions that are included in the, in the assessment tools, because um, a very important thing is that you will arrive to a different outcome based on the assessment tool that you have selected. In 1980, and sorry, in 2015, I've got my first paper published in IGED, and it was about a two state epidemiological study of muscle dysmorphia and eating disorders among men. And we use a double phase uh, approach. In the first screening phase, we use the uh, EAT 2026. We use a, a cutoff score even lower than the one that's suggested in the literature. And the cases at risk was almost 4%. But when we use uh, um, uh, a more gender sensitive measure, more oriented towards muscularity, like the drive for muscularity scales, individuals at risk of the developing muscle dysmorphia were uh, almost half of the sample. So we, when, when we are talking about the missing men, where are the missing men? So the missing men were hidden under the preoccupations about muscularity. Similarly, when, when we had to establish the prevalence for eating disorders, I've, I've interviewed um, participants at risk and we arrive to a prevalence lens rate of, of almost 2%, and all the cases were eating disorders not otherwise specified. And this is a, a similar finding that you will, you, will, uh, you will find in another epidemiological studies. However, when we, we um, assess the, the presence of possible cases of muscle dysmorphia, we arrived to a prevalence rate of almost 7%, which is kind of similar of the prevalence rate of eating disorders in this population. So it is, it is not that men does not suffer from eating disorder, it is that we have not been addressing them very, very properly. And uh, um, just to, 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 to finish with, with, with this presentation, I want to share with you a, um, a, a clinical case. But first, uh, let's, let's have in mind, once again, this diagnostic perspective uh, from Faber and, and, and colleagues that, that says that individuals may migrate from, may move from one um, diagnosed to the other since they share the same core psychopathology. This is a clinical uh, case uh, published in 2016, I believe, uh, by Mary and colleagues, and it describes the transition from a thinness oriented to a muscularity oriented disorder eating in an adolescent male. David was a 14 year old Caucasian male who presented for uh, treatment for anorexia nervosa after a, a four month period of uh, weight loss. He reported a drive to, for weight loss and a concomitant fear of gateway, rigid and restricted dietary practice, excessive exercise, and intermittent laxative use. His weight percentile shifted from the 57th percentile for age and height norm body weight at age 13 to the 19th percentile by age 14. And he was hospitalized due to acute bradycardia and um, uh, blood electrolyte abnormalities. Upon discharge from hospital, David underwent to a course of six months of family-based treatment, which was initially displayed by a, a marked anxiety around uh, gaining weight. However, throughout treatment, he was gradually able to consume an array of previously eliminated food or restricted food, desisted from weight loss oriented exercise, and actually he increased his body weight. He was able to eat without any parental support and even reporting a desire to gain weight and demonstrated no behavior or uh, actual indicant of a drive for weight loss as his weight increased through the treatment. He was discharged for treatment with, a, with his body weight uh, at the 55th percentile, 
consistent with his uh, pre-morbid uh, weight trajectory. However, in a six month uh, follow-up, David presented a body weight in the 78th percentile and reported a significant distress around his muscularity and uh, a drive to gain weight. He described himself as too small and reported a rigid arrogance to a meticulous calculated high protein di diet, noting market anxiety around not being able to consume enough protein alongside an intense muscle building exercise regime. This has started upon being told that he had to gain weight by his parents during the weight restoration process of FBT. During that time, David noted that if I absolutely needed to gain weight, then I thought to myself that it should be all muscle and not fat. I like very much this, this, this um, figure because it, it, it gives us the, um, this line, it's about his body, uh, the, the weight percentile, and we can see how he was hospitalized when he was in his, the 19, and, uh, sorry, nine, 19 percentile, and it was on the 78th uh, during follow-up. While he was uh, going through the anorexia phase, his drive for thinness was very high, but then something happened that he switched from a concern for muscularity, for, for thinness, and, and move into a concern for muscularity. This kind of diagnostic crossover, it, we are very common, we are very used to see this type of crossover in the clinic, and we are used to see them from anorexia to bulimia. And sometimes uh, um, patients with bulimia, when they learn how to manage their binges, they, 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 they lose some weight, not because it's an aim of the treatment, but as a consequence that they are managing their bingings much more better. And we know that we have, have to be very careful that they don't develop a dry for thinness and fell again into anorexia. So we are very aware about the, 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 cro the diagnostic crossover across the traditional eating disorders. But in this case, the, the physician, the, 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 the healthcare providers um, totally skipped that the core psychopathology remained while he was shifting from a um, thinness-oriented disorder eating to a muscularity-oriented disorder eating. Just to share some general thoughts. First, think outside the box. We have been looking for, or we have been assessing uh, uh, a type of eating disorders. There, 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 are, there, are, there are different types of eating disorders, mostly depending on the body ideal pursue. It's important to understand that the current conceptualization of muscle dysmorphia neglects disordered eating and uh, body weight concerns and fails to provide with an accurate information for the diagnosis and treatment. That muscle dysmorphia resembles eating disorders in terms of the core psychopathology, maintaining mechanism, adherence to strict diets, the presence of binge eating and compensatory behavior. And as I mentioned in the, the, the case report, just describe a diagnostic crossover. Um, and Latino prevalence of, of, of eating, of, of muscularity oriented eating, uh, resembles the prevalence of uh, eating disorders in previous um, female populations. Um, but one, one, one thing that comes to my mind is now um, uh, I, think, I, think, I think this experience has to um, help us to understand how some uh, minorities may, may struggle with eating disorders that may have different uh, uh, expressions. I'm thinking in a, not only transgender population, but also, for example, no binary or gender, gender queer population that may, may not follow a specific 
uh, gender stereotype, body ideal that may may be more identified with an uh, androgynous um, body ideal. So uh, let's 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 have in mind that eating disorders try, uh, tend to move across their category, diagnosis category, and just this uh, think outside the box have it as a, as a theme in our daily basis practice. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to any questions or any sh uh, thoughts that you would like to share. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Comte. This was wonderful and I appreciate you covering so much ground with us today. And you actually anticipated some of the questions that have, have people in the audience have offered in the Q&A. Uh, I, I'll actually start with one of the later questions because it it relates to what you just mentioned around there's the stereotypes, the gender stereotypes that many people get caught up in, um, including clinicians and parents, coaches, and individuals affected by eating disorders. Uh, and then there's uh, the uh, um, emerging understanding of how the patterns can be so different um, depending on how someone identifies their gender or their own transitions. I'm One of the, the questions is about how do we make sure we're continuing the research with males and that may be cisgender boys, cisgender men, uh, but at the same time not lose track of what may be happening in gender non-binary communities, transgender communities, uh, or the higher rates that, that we tend to see in cisgender girls and women. Uh, how do we navigate all of that without reproducing stereotypes? It's kind of a big question. Let's see what you think about that. How hard is not to reproduce stereotypes? Stereotypes are so easy to reproduce that we tend to do that all the time. Um, uh, I, 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 I think that this, this experience, those, those, those many men that we have over 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 see over saw through 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 assessment this has to give us we we have to take something out of this some experience out of this so i think research designs have to be very well thought we have to understand which is the population we are going to be assessing and we have to think outside the box which are the specific features of uh particular population that the assessment tools that I'm cho choosing are not capturing because an assessment tool will, will never capture, it will never explain 100% of the variance of the country that, of the contract that it's studying. If you, if, you validate, if you have validated one measure, one of the things that you look at is at explained variance. And none of the assessment tools that I get to validate got the opportunity to explain 100% of the variance of the construct. So um, there is something that I'm not going to be, there's something that it's not going to be included in an assessment tools. So from a research perspective, what, which additional question, I would have to think which additional question must I consider in order to capture things that are not captured by the available um, as assessment tools? And the, to finish with this question, one last thing would be um, having focus groups, having focus groups of the uh, conducting uh, focus groups uh, to understand the, 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 the specific concerns of underrepresentative or understudied populations may, may be enlightening. Thank you. And it sounds like a, no single instrument really can get the job done and, and needing to pull from multiple assessment tools. When I ask you one of the questions that's more clinically oriented and then move to one that's more public health oriented, since we're, we're talking ma mainly to a public health audience. So a clinical question is what does muscle dysmorphia recovery process what does that process look like that's the one million question um uh there there hasn't been uh we, we have a problem with muscle with muscle dysmorphia clinical research 
The main problem is that there isn't a shared diagnostic consensus. Uh, that's the, the one, one, one of the, the, the major issues. If, if we are not agree of what muscle dysmorphia is or how to define muscle dysmorphia, it's gonna be very difficult to identify and, 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 and help people who are struggling with muscle dysmorphia. So um, I, I, I think the first thing to do is we need to arrive to a consensus. Then there, there has been some suggestions from uh, well-experienced researchers and clinicians in the field. Some of these suggestions are based on their clinical research or on the, on the clinical work or, or in their research. Um, suggestion would be we don't pathologize, uh, pathologize the um, uh, exercise. Because if the individual will suspect that you will um, prevent him of, of doing exercise, he may leave treatment. And, and, and another thing, it has been suggested that group therapy for males they may be of help because men with eating disorders tend to live with, an, the, with, 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 with a double stigma, the stigma of having a mental health problem and the stigma of having uh, a, a female mental health disorder. So uh, uh, a therapeutic group of, of males may give uh, um, the, 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 a sense of belonging and a sense that I'm not the only one who's having this, uh, the, the, this, this problem. And also the, the suggestions would be to uh, provide um, eating disorders validated treatments. But I would like to make an observation there. That will work if the person is not under steroids. Steroids are uh, hormones, but are used as substances. They have two big problems. There are two main issues there. First, they give the person what the person is looking for. They increase their, 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 their muscle mass. That will disappear as soon they stop with the steroids. But at the beginning, they will get what they want. And this, that will be a huge positive reinforce, very difficult to deal with. But on the other hand, they are dealing with a substance. There are uh, uh, consequences or particular consequences of those substances, which may be an obstacle for treatment. I would say that if someone is under steroids, he or she may have to go through a substance abuse disorder program before starting an eating disorders treatment. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you also for bringing up the issue of the use of illicit anabolic steroids, because we see this increasingly among young men, boys, young men, and then across the genders, we see use of these products being sold online or in the gym or with uh, other people people are working out with, and they can be so dangerous. Um, I wanna take the conversation, uh, shift it over a little bit to the public health audience. There's so much emphasis in the public health community on the so-called war on obesity, to, to try to um, prevent weight gain in people or uh, reduce higher weights. That's a so common in public health. And then also the emphasis on exercise. But we know that for many people, the way this is done in public health can have a negative effect on body image and can set people up for escalating harmful methods. That's mostly been talked about in terms of girls and young women. But I'd love to hear your perspective on how is these kind of, this kind of public health communication affecting the boys and young men who you see or who are in your studies? Have you seen places where the public health communications have set someone up? For risk, and what would you advise all the public health professionals in the audience that they could do better, that would be safer around body image of young men? Um, I think there is a lack of presence uh, of, of public policy around eating disorders and body image issues among men. Uh, I think uh, I'm, 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 I'm very happy I get the opportunity to the opportunity to give these talks because um, uh, 
the, 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 I think the first thing, the important thing to do is to disseminate that this is happening. And uh, another important thing, it's, it's that um, whenever you give a talk, you have a very li limited time. There are, there are many car features, so characteristic associated with severe muscle dysmorphia cases. For example, some individuals, they may even use a synthetic oils. They inject their oils in their body and they are able to shape the, the muscle. It's not that they have grown the muscle, it's just oil and they're able to shape it. And they may get the, the, the oil in, encapsulated and they will go to, let's say for a, a, a trauma unit, and they will have his, his injury uh, cured, but uh, the physicians who are treating the encapsulation of the oil are not aware of all this psychiatric condition. So um, to, to answer to your questions, uh, on the one hand, I have never seen anything related to public health uh, Around around this this um, desire to gain weight in terms of muscle mass, there are no regulation on supplement use. Um, people are getting st steroids this, despite their being illegal. But uh, I think one one thing to do is we need to um, to disseminate this among healthcare providers because. Most of these people may go to see, seek for help when they are injured, are not because due to the um, functional impairment associated to the psychiatric disorder. So I would say first, uh, we need to have the whole healthcare community, uh, we need to arrive to a consensus, understand what it is, don't pathologize. Uh, physical exercise, understand the, the dangers uh, uh, around uh, steroids, and, and then we need to get our voice out to have some sort of public policy support. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it sounds like a lot of education is needed across healthcare providers, including in emergency medicine, and then also in the public health field. Uh, your work is very novel. I, mean, I haven't seen any classes uh, or many lectures at all in public health schools covering this. So we're out of time now. And I want to thank you, Dr. Comte, for an outstanding presentation. We had a terrific questions from the audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but please feel free to email striped at the Harvard School of Public Health, and we can see if we can get you some more answers to your questions. So with that, we'll conclude our session today. Keep an eye out for the recording, which we'll post next week on the Harvard Chan School of Public Health website and the Strike website. Thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Compte.